Welcome everybody to the new talk of the Holo Club. Uh, so today it's a pleasure to have uh, Moshe Rosali, who's also part, uh, part of the, the Holotube team, <laughs> who will talk us about, okay, sorry, let me say it's from the University of British Columbia. And he will uh, tell us about effective field theory for chaotic CFTs. So please Moshe, whenever you want. Okay, so uh, a few things first. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this kind of talk. It feels very, very strange. So please interrupt me often. Uh, if you feel like uh, uh, turning on the video, then I'll talk to some faces. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance to any sort of difficulties that we're probably going to experience. Um, good. So the other thing is, uh, I kind of like this idea of Holotube, of some ongoing uh, seminar, so I thought it was a, a good idea and uh, I could help in any way I can. Uh, so I was kind of uh, struggling a little bit by, about uh, choosing a topic, uh, because recently I've been thinking mostly about the black hole information paradox and disorder averaging in gravity and this sort of interesting things that came up. Uh, which is not quite related to uh, what most of you have been talking about or thinking about. Uh, so I chose to talk about uh, some older work, which is uh, maybe slightly more related. In particular, this work is based on uh, uh, papers with Felix Hall uh, and also with my uh, excellent student, Wyatt Reeves. Uh, two papers and one that is uh, coming. Uh, and I'm going to talk mostly about the earlier paper, uh, just because it's a little bit more familiar context. Uh, it's a little bit easier to understand. Things got a little bit more uh, technical and more into the language of abstract CFT a little bit later on. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep things a little bit less technical. Uh, the main character is going to be quantum chaos, which kind of it's a natural outgrowth of those of us who, who've been working on uh, on uh, application of uh, EDS to, to uh, condensed matter physics. It's still uh, something that condensed matter physicists think about a lot. Uh, but since, uh, again, this is a little bit different from what uh, many of you uh, have been thinking about, uh, I will uh, spend a lot of time uh, on introduction. Now, uh, if the introduction is a little bit excessive, uh, then please let me know and I'll go a little bit faster. Uh, okay, and please interrupt me often with, uh, with questions. Now let's see how I move the slide. Good, so this is the outline. I'm going to spend a lot of time on introduction and motivation just to explain what the context uh, of this work is. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about the scrambling and out of time order correlators. That might be the part of the talk that uh, may be a little bit more, it's a little bit uh, excessive introduction since this, uh, this subject has been uh, beaten to death a little bit, but uh, I will proceed and you will interrupt me if uh, I'm going slowly. Um, so the goal is to develop uh, the, the, the mechanics to calculate those things in some sort of coarse grain or effective description. Uh, and I'm going to give the paradigm for what I mean by that uh, in uh, talking about the soft mode in, uh, in conformal uh, quantum mechanics or uh, zero plus one dimensional the effective field theory. Uh, this is the start of all the subject. It's the famous Schwarzian theory. Uh, it comes as the low energy theory of uh, various models, including uh, the SYK model, but I'm going to discuss it in the context of gravity as the boundary theory dual to Jakiv Teitelbaum gravity. And from that point of view, it's very easy to derive and understand uh, what it means to have an action for a soft mode, what it means for it to be a soft mode, uh, derive the Schwarzschild action and its coupling to matter, and see how it's related to, to chaos, uh, which is what I'm going to uh, discuss earlier. And uh, right. <clears throat> So, so the, the aim was to understand this type of uh, soft mode action 
in uh, CFTs, in particular in higher dimensional CFTs, but as I said, most of what I'm going to be discussing is the theory of source mode in two-dimensional CFT. <coughs> I'm going to proceed in basically the same uh, order as in the introduction. I'm going to derive the action, or at least the parts of the action uh, that we need to discuss chaos, uh, namely just the quadratic action and the coupling to, to sources. And then uh, describe by your correlation functions using uh, this uh, formalism. There is an understanding of how to calculate uh, more complicated objects, not necessarily related to chaos, uh, which I'm going to touch on a little bit. Uh, but since this is not the main focus uh, of this audience, I'm not going to discuss it too much. Then I'm going to just going to talk about the higher dimensional CFT in a couple of slides. Uh, there, there's a, actually an interesting uh, understanding of uh, various, uh, various technical details of the two-dimensional case even uh, in reformulated dimensional CFT in the language that is more abstract CFT language. Uh, for example, the language of the shadow formalism. But again, since this is a little bit more technical and not uh, kind of the bread and butter of, of this group of people, I'm just going to uh, mention it briefly and, and, and maybe tell you a little bit what it's good for. And then I'm going to discuss future directions uh, and, and maybe wildly speculate and, and see, uh, see where, uh, where we can, what, what we can do with all of that. Okay, good. So let's see. So, so basically the introduction has to introduce you to the whole big subject of quantum chaos, in particular quantum chaos in many body system, which is even a more complicated subject. Uh, so, so, so let me just uh, say enough to understand the context of, of this particular work. Uh, and not, uh, not dwell too much into it. So maybe the, the, the way to understand uh, this is to kind of compare and contrast with classical chaos, which is more well understood and also maybe more well known from, from just uh, undergraduate education. So uh, the basic distinction I want to make is between the kind of short time manifestation of chaos and long time uh, manifestation. So classical chaos is kind of, uh, you can describe it by uh, discussing trajectories in a phase space. Uh, if you start with trajectories with slightly different initial conditions, we know that there is the butterfly effect. So the diversion of trajectories in a chaotic system or in one particular definition of chaotic system, nearby trajectories go grow apart very quickly, exponentially fast. Um, so this is uh, something that's going to have an, uh, uh, something similar in the quantum context. Now, after the uh, trajectories become uh, uh, farther from each other, uh, if you wait for a very long time, then there is a other set of issues to do with ergodicity. In some sense, the trajectories become dense in phase space and if the phase space is compact, they just cover it uh, densely. And that is the reason why statistical descriptions of classical chaotic system is a, uh, is, is a successful description. You can, uh, you can in some sense uh, talk about uh, averages over phase space as capturing late time uh, quantities in classical chaotic system. But I want to just make the distinction that, you know, the, the butterfly effect and ergodicity are uh, different issues and that's actually something that uh, persists in, in quantum system, either single particle, few particles or, or many particles. So, Good. So in quantum chaos, we have something now uh, following Kitaev, uh, we have something now that's called out of time order correlators, which uh, uh, quantifies for you uh, the butterfly effect, the 
well, there's no trajectories in quantum mechanics, but something similar to that, something that happens immediately uh, that depends sensitively on initial condition. So this is a short time manifestation. They just uh, uh, tell you about uh, short time manifestation chaos. Uh, there is also an order, especially in the context of single particle uh, quantum chaos, there is an older study of literature to do with the long uh, time manifestation of uh, quantum chaos. And that's kind of a, a very strange uh, uh, situation in which, you know, those, uh, those two maybe different eras uh, talk about uh, the same sort of thing using very, very different concepts. So usually when uh, the old fashioned quantum chaos uh, concept have to do with uh, statistics of the spectrum or later on the ETH, which has to do with also eigen vectors of the Hamiltonian. Uh, there's some sort of statistical uh, characterization of both eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and somehow that uh, random matrix or ETH uh, applies to very, very long time and it's, so it kind of replaces uh, the idea of classical ergodicity. So, so uh, whereas uh, the Lepernov exponent is very similar to what it quantifies in, uh, in classical chaos. Basically, you can start with kind of well-defined trajectory and see how those trajectories diverge before they stop being well-defined trajectories. So because this is a short time, then in some sense, the classical and quantum uh, concepts are similar, maybe not identical, but similar up to their interest time. Uh, at late time, the, the concepts are completely different. If you wait for a very long time, quantum perfects will take over and the classical ergodicity, uh, at least in a pure system with the classical ergodicity doesn't play any role in the late time physics. So you need some new uh, concept of what quantum ergodicity is to explain why statistical descriptions of the system is a good description uh, at late times where you know that things thermalize. Okay. So, so, so quantum ergodicity is supposed to provide the foundation of quantum statistical mechanics. Again, the statistical description of, of, of large systems. Uh, and, and basically uh, the idea is kind of encoded in the ETH, simple observable in, in, in a typical state, uh, looks thermal. It's not that you have to thermalize by necessarily coupled to an external bath. It could be a closed system. Uh, you don't have to talk about Gibbsian uh, uh, ensembles necessarily. You just talk about the single system evolving unitarily, but you probe it uh, with simple observables that are kind of oblivious to all the detail of what's really going on. And if you do that, then statistical descriptions are good, okay? So, so I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, the, the final thermal state is, is well understood and the dynamics towards the thermal state is still uh, uh, not completely understood. For example, time scales to do with the dynamics, I think are still uh, maybe more difficult to explain from my microscopic point of view. And, and just, uh, just, just uh, the, the last remark is that this is not just a, a mathematical formalism to kind of uh, pretty up some well understood physics. Uh, in the process of uh, describing uh, this, you, you find that not all the system, even complicated system with interactions, not all of them thermalized. There's something called many body localization. Uh, so this is actually uh, a study of, of physical effects and not just, uh, not just a mathematical exercise or trying to formalize some well-defined uh, or some well-understood concept. Okay, so let me pause here for questions, just to make sure that uh, I got everybody still on board. Any question, anybody? Okay, good. So, so this is uh, this is the basic distinction in this uh, 
in this transparency, the distinction between short and long time. So what are what effective field theory that we're discussing here uh, is going to uh, try to encode is some kind of coarse-grained or, or uh, effective, as uh, as uh, the word is usually used, uh, calculation of short time cones and out of time autocorrelators. But one of the nice uh, or one of the interesting things, as you probably heard in other talk, is that in a holographic theory specifically, there, he, there is a, a connection between this type of uh, description of the short time physics and the more familiar description of long time physics, namely hydrodynamics. So you know that uh, towards when uh, you, uh, you lo look at long enough times, uh, then basically the only thing that uh, survives is the long wavelength conserved quantities uh, and they have a dynamics that's described by the hydrodynamics. And because this operates in a different time regime, uh, it's a priori unrelated to what I'm discussing, but in uh, holographic theory, there is a very direct relation, in particular the modes that appear in both effective field theories are identical. This is, I think, uh, an opportunity because uh, you know the, the holographic theories are very uh, specific uh, theories with very kind of fine-tuned uh, properties, and it's kind of nice to be able to quantify precisely why that miracle happens. And here we have a clue. Uh, so, so, so one of the first uh, such clues, and this is probably something you heard about, is that quantities that appear in this uh, out of time order correlators, like the butterfly velocity, uh, also appear or are also related to quantities that appear in hydrodynamic, like diffusion constants, etc. So this relation is a little bit mysterious, and and in the context of this effective theory, this relation is even deeper and and still mysterious. Okay, so uh, we're going to restrict ourselves to CFDs just because that's easier to deal with. And we're going to talk about an effective scramble, scramble on theory. This is, uh, this is going to uh, be an effective theory in the sense of uh, being a truncation of the field theory that is sufficient to reproduce the effect that you're interested in, the out of time order correlator. They are also, this theory will also calculate those fine-grained out-of-time order correlator that Felix and myself talked about back in uh, 2017, but I'm not going to harp on that too much. There is a series of longer and longer time scale associated with more and more fine-grained uh, out-of-time order correlators, and we, uh, we are able to calculate those as well in this effective field theory. Okay. Good, so as I said, I'm going to start mostly on uh, talking mostly about two-dimensional CFTs. There's also a paper by Kristen Jordan. There's a series of paper by now on ATS-3 gravity, which uh, complete the story, including on the non-linear terms in action. Uh, and and uh, I'm not going to discuss it in this talk, but this is useful to calculate interesting conformal field theory quantities like conformal blocks. So, so, uh, so again, I'm, I, if, if you know what that means, uh, one way to understand this theory is that this is effective field theory to describe the identity sector in, in large C conformal field theories. Okay. After discussing uh, the two dimensional case, I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit higher dimensional CFTs. Uh, we are at the moment restricted to maximally chaotic system for reasons that I'm not going to discuss. Uh, so the, the conformal field theories that I'm going to discuss are going to be mostly in even dimension and they're going to be defined on hyperbolic space. So this, uh, this is the case where the conformal field theory in any dimension is still maximally chaotic. Uh, and we are able to show that, you know, there's a theory of a scramblon. It's an effective mode that captures uh, this out of time order correlator dynamics. And again, furthermore, this scramblon is also related to, uh, to hydrodynamic modes. 
Okay. In the higher dimensional case, there is a better or, or a more complete understanding of this effective field theory and it's related to, to the shadow formulas. Okay. So I think this is more or less the end of the introduction. I probably took a, a long time. So let me pause for questions. Any questions from anybody? Okay, so let me continue then. So again, this might be the uh, point that um, uh, maybe uh, discussing a little bit too much of those out of time order correlators. Please stop me if this is getting a little bit uh, too familiar. Uh, again, I'm trying to make this talk more or less self-contained for people who have not thought about this subject very much. So this out of time order correlator are all the rate for many years now. They were introduced by uh, Kitaev. So let me quickly uh, discuss them. Uh, they're sort of uh, kind of intellectual cousins of uh, various uh, things. One of them I already mentioned, if you have classical uh, trajectories and they diverge from each other at some exponential rate, rate uh, this defined layer point of exponent, we'll see that uh, there is a similar type of, uh, if you want, quantum layer point of exponent that's defined by these out of time order correlators. There is a very strong relation to models of uh, uh, growth of operators. If you start with an operator that's simple and you subject it to Hamiltonian evolution, these operators become more and more complicated. In particular, if it's localized in some chain, it becomes more and more delocalized. And that growth is related in some very precise way to this out of time or order correlator. There's also something called the Schmidt echo. And uh, for the interest of time, I probably will just keep describing what that is. So basically you're looking for uh, uh, something that is a response uh, of the system uh, to an initial perturbation. So this is the usual linear response story where you perturb the system by some operator W at time zero and measure the response by some other operator V at some subsequent time T and to quantify the uh, relation between the two, you take the commutator. This is how you uh, find what is the relation between two operators. Now, once you have an operator, you want to see if it's large or it's small, uh, you have to produce a number out of it. If you just take the expectation lab value, this is what's called linear response. Uh, the, next, uh, the next thing you can do is to take the expectation value of the commutator in a the thermal state. You put the minus for just uh, aesthetic reasons. Uh, and that defines for you uh, some quantity called C of T. Now, if the time t is uh, long enough compared to the uh, inverse, inverse temperature, then there's really only one interesting part of this, uh, well, actually two interesting parts of these uh, uh, four terms that you get for expanding the commutator. Uh, two of them uh, that have uh, subsequent time zero, zero t, t will just factorize at a long enough time and won't contribute to the connected correlator. So the really interesting part of this uh, commutator, the expectation value of the commutator squared, I should say the absolute value of the commutator squared, if it and W are not necessarily a Hermitian. Uh, the interesting part is the out of time order correlator where the times kind of uh, interchange zero T, zero T. Okay. And this, uh, this is the thing that quantifies for you the kind of the uh, exponent or the butterfly effect. For it to be meaningful, it has to be, uh, to start small in order to, so, so this thing uh, is bounded by some number of order one, I think it's two uh, for, for Hermitian operators. Uh, so in order to see some sort of growth, it's better start slow, uh, small. So in large end theories, it's kind of, uh, in some sense, uh, suppressed by one over n. So it naturally starts uh, at the low value and then it has the room to grow. So the initial growth, so this is, uh, 
this follows a, a curve that starts exponential and then saturates. Uh, and, and the initial exponent is defined for utility upon exponent. And then later on, there's some independently interesting dynamics where this moves towards saturation. Okay, good. So uh, just just uh, a few uh, comments. So so let me skip some of those comments that are maybe not as interesting for our, for our purposes. Uh, this out of door order correlator starts very low and then it saturates and the, 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 this defines also a scrambling time, the time where it uh, becomes order one and the scrambling time is, for, is, is of order log n and famously this is uh, something that you can also measure in black hole physics. And incredibly the great growth of, uh, of uh, this Lyapunov exponent is bounded in quantum mechanical, mechanical theories and uh, it, it is the famous result of, of uh, Maldacena, Schenker, and, and Stanford. So I went uh, a little bit quickly through this uh, description because I'm assuming that uh, this is something you heard about before. So, so let me pause again for questions. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page. All right, so I'm going to assume that everybody is awake and carry on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so as I said, so I want to calculate this in an effective field theory. I'm going to quickly introduce an effective field theory that does the job just to demonstrate what I mean precisely. This is the famous Schwarzian theory that does it in the original context of the SYK model. And then I'm going to try to construct theories like that in higher dimensional CFDs. Okay. So most of the details of this part uh, do not matter very much, but uh, uh, the final result is what I want to focus on. So one way to get into the Schwarzian theory is to just look at the low energy or low frequency uh, dynamics of uh, the SYK model. Or, or some other models that also have the same infrared dynamics. And the other one is to talk about uh, gravity in one plus one dimension, the, the so-called JT gravity. This is a, a simple uh, theory of gravity. Because it's low dimensional, gravity is kind of trivial. In fact, gravity by itself is formally minus one degrees of freedom. You need an additional field for it to even be locally trivial. So it's not over constrained. So you do that and you add the dilaton. So this is a dilaton gravity. It has formally zero uh, number of degrees of freedom. That means that it's locally trivial. Every solution to the equation of motion is locally ADS2. This is very similar to pure gravity in three dimension uh, with a negative cosmological constant where every solution is locally ADS3, uh, but there could be still interesting uh, global dynamics. And we are also going to couple it to matter fields. We're going to keep the matter fields non fluctuating. Okay. There'll be external probes. So any solution is uh, trivial. Uh, it's locally ADS2, and the dilaton is locally can be mapped in some coordinate system to, to the, the, the form one of a, uh, one of a Z, uh, where Z equals zero is the boundary of ADS2. In other words, it diverges near the boundary. So the theory only makes sense if you put some sort of cutoff uh, in ADS2, you don't go all the way to the boundary and uh, you put some boundary conditions on those cutoffs. And then the dynamics is that of uh, the cutoff surface. So different solutions to the equation of motion are identical to each other locally, but they differ in the shape of the boundary curve at which you satisfy those uh, boundary conditions. So in some sense, uh, this is familiar from topological theories. The only dynamic is if you put the theory on a, a surface with the boundary, you have some edge modes. So you can think about uh, the Schwarzian theory is the edge mode of this uh, JT gravity. Good. 
So when you uh, when you reduce uh, this gravitational action, including its boundary term, into uh, into this dynamic of the boundary curve, the action reduces to uh, to an action for this soft mode T of U. T is the shape of the uh, boundary as a function of some fixed variable u. So t of u is the shape of the boundary curve. Uh, so, so in other words, it's a diffeomorphism of the circle. The fact that it's a diffeomorphism will uh, come in a little bit later. And you get the famous Schwarzian theory. It's a highly nonlinear theory. Uh, t prime never gets to be zero, by the way, so that's not a singular theory. Uh, and the Schwarzian action appears in many contexts, partially because it's determined in some sense only by symmetries. Uh, if you have a conformable theory with a particular pattern of explicit and, and spontaneous breaking, uh, which is the case both in JT gravity and in SYK and also in uh, some other models, then you guarantee to get that action. Okay, so this is the action. This would be the paradigm of what I call a soft mode action, uh, in the sense that you can calculate those out of time order correlators without knowing the full microscopic physics, just by focusing on this one single low energy mode. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me just very quickly demonstrate how would you go about calculate. This is a very highly nonlinear action, but you can do perturbation theory. You want to calculate those other time correlators in a, a thermal background. So you, uh, you impose the correct boundary condition by doing this transformation. You transform T to the tangent of some tau. That way you have the correct Euclidean the time periodicity, I take the temperature to be too high. And then you just do a subtle, uh, you, you just do a perturbation theory around some solution. Tau u equal u is just a, a solution to the equation of motion. You can just uh, see that that's the case. And you just, uh, you just perturb around that. And that perturbation theory just gives you a bunch of Feynman diagrams and that Feynman diagrams, I, those Feynman diagrams will calculate for you correlation function, including those out of time order correlators that we're interested in. So this is maybe the simplest possible uh, way to calculate perturbative quantum gravity quantities. This is, a, this is the, uh, the story that I want to replicate uh, in the higher dimensional case. Good, so this, uh, this perturbative more epsilon is what I would call the scramblon. So in particular, here's an example of just showing you that you can calculate its, uh, its, uh, its propagator. Okay. And also, if you look at higher order and perturbation theory, let me go back to the previous thing, then you can see that there's going to be interaction terms, self-interactions for those, uh, for that kind of, uh, perturbative mode epsilon. So this is basically quantum gravity. You have a mode epsilon. It has propagator. It has uh, vertices. I'm not going to go into the details. They're not too complicated, but you can uh, basically do familiar perturbation theory to calculate correlation functions. Okay. The correlation function that we'll be interested in is a four-point function of some external operators. Uh, that are inserted in order to measure this out of time order correlators. And uh, I'm going to uh, very briefly just show that uh, that matter action. So those matter action, the, the describe the way that external matter, I'm not going to be interested in fluctuation of matter. So these are external probes. How do they couple to the Schwarzen mode T? So this is sort of a bilocal uh, action because we insert two operators at a time. And then once we have that action, again, it's a very complicated action, but you can just do perturbation theory. So you can expand that complicated action in terms of uh, this uh, scramble on epsilon. And I'm, uh, I called those uh, interaction terms of the action as Bs. 
these are just interaction vertices that tell you our external matter couples to this scrambling theory. So here's an example of what it would look like to living order B1 couples to one power of epsilon and B2 couples to two, two powers of epsilon, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and, and for our calculation, we'll need B1 and B2. Good. Good, so I'm not going to look at the calculation uh, in detail again for the interest of time, uh, but uh, I'm just going to say that you can calculate the out of time order correlators. There is this sort of a mini industry of calculating those in microscopic models. And uh, this, uh, this uh, calculation is reproduced uh, by calculating uh, in the effective theory that I just described. So this is a particular perturbation theory and you can calculate uh, basically whatever you want, but in particular, you can calculate the Stefanov exponent and you can see uh, that, uh, that uh, you, you find precisely what you want. So this is an effective theory in uh, the same sense uh, that you usually describe effective field theory, basically you truncate the theory to some finitely many modes and you calculate what you want to uh, uh, specify precision and you get the result of a microscopic theory from that much simpler theory. But I, you know, there's some mystery here, which is, there are two mysteries. First of all, uh, the usual justification for uh, the use of effective field theory is going to some sort of uh, low frequency or asymptotic, uh, asymptotically late time. And then you know what are the elements of this effective field theory. For example, at finite temperature, those are going to be uh, conserved quantities on pass possibly some Colson modes uh, if you have spontaneously broken symmetries. But here we're not going to asymptotically late times. We are staying at some finite times. And uh, in particular, it's not clear what justifies uh, the, the use of effective field theory in general. The other thing is this is a effective field theory that's very intimately related to hydrodynamics and there's no clear understanding, at least I don't understand clearly why that is. Not only that you get the effective field theory of the scramblum, but you also, uh, the scramblum is basically uh, related to a hydrodynamic mode. It's some sort of, uh, if you want, analytic continuation of, of, uh, of, of, the, of that mode. So the motivation to our work was uh, this observation by Blake, Lee, and Liu that uh, what they call quantum hydrodynamics. There is a theory of an energy mode, which is a hydrodynamic mode, but it's extrapolated away from the long wave limit. And with uh, additional structures, they show that in general, you're going to uh, find that you reproduce the maximally uh, chaotic uh, the opponent of exponents, the value that is saturated the bound. Uh, it turns out that with this uh, type of effective field theory, you are restricted to uh, be maximally chaotic, but it's still interesting to see what else do you need to do to not be maximally chaotic. So our goal uh, was to derive such theory at large CCFT and uh, see what's the origin of this, uh, this effective field theory. And as it turns out, this theory is also good to calculate uh, other quantities, not just the uh, other time all the correlators. So I'm kind of uh, running a little bit late. Uh, my talk at the 10, I'm assuming, right? So, or is that correct? Sorry, you were, you were asking about the time. Yeah, it's more or less time. Uh, no, you still have, yeah, you still have uh, almost half an hour. I do? Okay. All right. So I okay. won't. Uh, I won't. Okay. You know, we started very, we started very punctually. Yeah, let's say 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. That's fine. Uh, that's okay. So I won't panic as much. Well, you know, I, I, I wanted it to be mostly an introduction. I wanted yeah, yeah. it to be mostly an introduction. So I'm not going to go through all the details. 
Uh, but uh, let me just flash precisely how we understand this kind of uh, soft mode in uh, conformal field theories and what, uh, what do we need to do to sort of constructively uh, build that uh, perturbation theory that I discussed uh, before. So in the Schwarzschild theory, we had the full nonlinear theory, nonlinear theory. Uh, and in the higher dimensional field theories, maybe one way to understand it is that we want to build directly the perturbation theory and calculate those uh, quantities that we're interested in. So basically what we want to do is to uh, mimic the idea of uh, constructing a theory of Goldson Moson. So what uh, we identify, the ansatz for our soft mode, is a space-time dependent conformal transformation. So this is something that would be a symmetry if uh, it was not space-time dependent, and therefore it's kind of a soft mode. It has arbitrarily low action uh, if it becomes space-time uh, space dependent. So this is something that would be, uh, for example, a theory of a Goldstein model. Now, in two dimensional, you have infinitely many conformal symmetries. Uh, basically, any holomorphic function, uh, you can uh, do a transformation. Delta Z is epsilon of Z for any holomorphic function, and that would be uh, uh, a symmetry. Uh, in order to make it space-time dependent, that means that this epsilon z is no longer holomorphic. It also has some um, uh, z-bar dependence. Okay. Now, similarly, we have some anti-holomorphic transformation, which we also promote to be uh, space-time dependent with full space-time dependence, and they become uh, soft mode. So they become gapless. So now, because uh, they are related to conformal transformation, we know what their action, okay? So for example, uh, let me skip this uh, idea of the Legendre transform. There's a way of uh, formally doing what I said. I'm just going to skip that. Uh, so it's clear that basically you want to do a conformal transformation uh, but you want to uh, you want to make it uh, space-time dependent. So that induces an action because T, the energy momentum tensor, is a generator of conformal transformation. To leading order, the quadratic action depends on the correlation function of two such uh, stress energies. So your goal is to calculate the correlation function uh, of these two Ts and those will define for you what is the quadratic action. The same idea uh, comes about, uh, you know, the same idea uh, defines for you what would be the cubic and quartic action, et cetera, et cetera. You need to have more and more, a uh, higher and higher correlation function of the energy momentum tensor. So this is the starting point of our perturbation theory. Remember, we started with some soft mode that had some quadratic action and that therefore some propagator you can calculate. You can do exactly the same thing that I uh, discussed before in the context of uh, the Schwarzian theory. You can, uh, first of all, uh, move uh, to find the temperature in any conformal field theory. This is done by doing the conformal transformation, but uh, so this is cheap. Uh, and then you do perturbation theory. Before we started with the nonlinear action, we kind of uh, expanded here. Here we sort of uh, build this action perturbatively itself. Okay, so uh, when you do that, you can calculate the action and you can calculate the propagator. We have done that. And the propagator uh, in momentum space, in Euclidean momentum space, is, is uh, what I write here. So this is very similar uh, to the propagator that we had before. In particular, something that I won't harp on, but if you want to ask me about, there is uh, this SL2 symmetries that appear in uh, the Schwarzschild theory, and those actually are very interesting to discuss in any conformal theories. 
uh, you can see that because this propagator has F poles and you have to dis basically discuss uh, how to treat those poles uh, when you do the Fourier transform based to back, back to position space. Okay, so for example, uh, if you do this Fourier transform, you get that the retarded propagator is this expression. And you can see that generically you will have exponentially growing behavior because the retarded propagator, this first term there that looks like e to the t. Uh, and therefore, if you use that propagator for correlation function, uh, you have at least the chance of getting exponentially growing. The other thing that's uh, still missing in this effective field theory is those external probes. We want to calculate four-point function of some, uh, some external operators in order to calculate the out-of-time order correlators. So we need to define those. And, and, and we have a prescription now to calculate those. You basically take their action in the absence uh, of the soft mode and you do a conformal transformation a space-time dependent conformal transformation. To, so there's some action acquired, but you basically have a prescription of how to do that. And we can do that perturbatively in uh, the strength of that uh, conformal transformation or the soft mode. And we can define a matter action that's very similar to what we had before in terms of those Bs. The Bs are interaction vertices they depend on the dimension of the external operator H and H bar and their location. And in fact, because uh, in the Schwarzschild theory, those uh, couplings also come apart from a conformal transformation, uh, the exact uh, form of those Vs is, is basically identical to the one dimensional case. And that's going to be also the case in, in higher dimension. Uh, of course, they depend on more locations. So once you use them, they give you different answers, but the, uh, the form of those vertices is very similar. Okay, so what we find uh, when we calculate that, so again, the calculation is very similar to what we did before. We have Feynman diagrams. We have external operators coupling to our soft mode. We have the propagator of the soft mode, and we basically have an exchange diagram. Uh, so what we find is that we have a very simple calculation to, especially if we don't want the full four-point function, but just the exponentially growing mode, it's really, really easy to get that. Uh, and we get the same out-of-time order correlator that's calculated before by Roberts and Stanford. Uh, we calculate uh, both the, the Lyapunov exponent and the butterfly velocity. Uh, now we have spatial dependence, so you can also ask about how uh, chaos propagate the, in the spatial direction. Uh, in CFTs, it really has to be the speed of light from conformal invariance, so you know maybe that's not uh, very surprising we get the right answer. We also got the pole skipping phenomena that was discussed by this paper by Blake, uh, Lee, and Lee. So uh, let me pause for questions. If anybody has any questions at the moment. All right. So so this is basically everything uh, that I wanted to say. Let me just make comments and maybe discuss a little bit uh, the higher dimensional case. So more comments on the effective field theory. This is uh, this effective field theory was the, was constructed in the schwinger keldish contour. Uh, maybe in this particular case of two-dimensional CFT, that's not as significant. I think the SL2 symmetries, again, I'm trying to keep things uh, not very technical, but they're very interested to discuss in higher dimensional CFT. They generalize those uh, of uh, the SYK or the Schwarzen theory. They also include the shift symmetry of Blake at all. And uh, I think we only understood that really when we started discussing the higher dimensional case, where it's part of this uh, beautiful story of the shadow formalism. Okay, 
And the final thing is, uh, even though this is not my focus here, I'm trying to talk about uh, mostly this out of time order correlators. You can calculate other quantities using this effective field theory. And generally speaking, this Euclidean action is, is or this action is useful as a theory of the identity conform block in large C CFDs. So uh, we calculated the conform block, uh, at the four point conform block. There is a nice paper by, by Felix and uh, Tarek Hanus that calculated the 6.1 in the particular channel. It seems to be an effective way of doing that. Uh, there's various ways of calculating those quantities in CFTs. Uh, so I'm not really sure how this is competitive, but it is at least familiar a uh, way of calculating things. You want to calculate, for example, the one of a C correction, you just calculate one of the diagrams. Uh, so, so there is a systematic way now of calculating uh, conformal field theory quantities that are by and large now calculated uh, using more algebraic quantities. So I wouldn't say what is more transparent or what is easier. I have less background in those methods, but uh, Feynman diagrams are uh, familiar at least. Okay, so this is mostly what I wanted to discuss. Uh, in this forum. So uh, let me just discuss the paper that we wrote about the high dimensional CFTs. We also have um, some work in progress. So I'll be brief. So basically I already described what we need in order to, uh, to construct this effective field theory. If we identify the soft mode, we conjecture that this is a space-time dependent conformal transformation. We perform this conformal transformation perturbatively and see what is the resulting action. The resulting action will involve basically correlation functions of the generator of conformal summation, which is the energy momentum tensor. So this in principle can be applied to any CFT, but the easiest thing to do if we want to work at finite temperature is to work on CFT on a hyperbolic space. The reason is that this trick that I did of the conformal transformation to move from zero temperature to finite temperature only works in a higher dimension if you're kind of compromised and say that your spatial uh, direction is hyperbolic space. And then you have a conformal transformation that maps you to a finite temperature where the temperature is fine tuned to be the same uh, as the radius of curvature of that hyperbolic space. Okay, so then you can use a correlation function in the vacuum uh, to describe fine temperature physics, otherwise it will be a little bit more complicated. So we discuss specifically that theory. That theory is still maximally chaotic. We seem to be uh, still restricted to the maximally chaotic case. We calculated the pilot flight -like velocity as what was calculated previously by Perlmutter and confirmed it's, it's the same one. Uh, and and, and just, uh, just as you might expect, in even dimension, the soft mode gets its action from the conformal anomaly, at least in the order that we discussed. Okay. We can also understand the soft mode using the shadow formalism. There is a way uh, of projecting into the identity sector by using the energy momentum tensor in shadow. And one way to understand our soft mode is as related to the shadow uh, of the energy momentum tensor. It turns out that the shadow, and this is probably uh, going to not be useful for too many people, but let me just say that sentence. The shadow turns out to be a total derivative, so you can just write it as a derivative of some operator. That operator is a non-unitary operator, it has dimension minus one, uh, and that's exactly our soft mode. We saw that this is identical to the other way of thinking about the soft mode as a generator of a conformal transformation. So this is generalized the uh, soft mode in two dimensional of if, if you want the two dimensional Polyakov action that could be written as a local uh, action uh, using a particular definition of the soft mode. Okay. Good, so let me uh, conclude. This was just flashing very quickly uh, the higher dimensional CFT uh, and the fact that we can do the same thing uh, as we did before. So, uh, 
So possible direction for future research. So the most ambitious thing is that it turns out that this kind of effective field theory uh, describes necessarily maximally chaotic cases. And one of the reasons why this uh, work, I think, uh, could be interesting is that it's there to uh, illuminate maybe what's so special about holographic theories and in particular uh, that mystery that in such theories the late time regime described by hydrodynamics is also useful for the early time regime that calculate the OTOCs. Clearly in order to really understand that miracle you have to understand what happens in more generic case uh, and in particular, you can discuss things that are not quite maximally chaotic, but almost maximally chaotic, and ask what new ingredient uh, is useful. Those theories are kind of stringy in the bulk. So in some sense, you kind of starting to look at stringy effects of those uh, in those effective field theories. So when what new ingredients you need uh, in order to, to discuss such theories. And we tried various things. I uh, think it's fair to say that none of them uh, seems to be uh, doing the job at the moment. One thing that we're uh, writing at the moment is, uh, so the, 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 the thing that we did in two dimension is, is, is a, a closed form uh, nonlinear completion that was discussed by Kristen and Jordan uh, you can, in some sense, uh, do the same thing in higher dimension. Uh, in higher dimension, conformal symmetry doesn't give you the full information about the theory, so, uh, but it gives you some partial information, so we're kind of uh, hopeful that uh, this theory will be good for some specific questions. So we're looking for those applications. The uh, effective field theory, as I said, is effective in calculating uh, conformal blocks, uh, including corrections, including higher blocks. Uh, and uh, I, th I think the question is how much easier, or is it easier for calculating uh, these quantities uh, comparable or better than existing methods? And then there's various other things that you can sort of start to think about based on, the, on this analysis. So good, looks like I concluded in time. So uh, yeah, please ask questions. Thank you very much, Moshe. Yeah. So I have yeah, a go. question. Yeah, go ahead, Luke. Um, about the higher dimensional case. So, so as you explained, you, you have to focus on, uh, you have to work in hyperbolic space for, for the conformal map to work. Um, but this also means right. that correlators, that thermal correlators are basically fixed in terms of, uh, you know, zero temperature correlators. Um, so it's not really what we usually mean by finite temperature physics in that sense. And in, in particular, we, you don't expect to have a hydrodynamic regime in this type of theory, meaning the late time physics won't be, you know, won't have the usual hydrodynamic description. So, um, so, I, so my question is, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it might, yeah, it might be, I mean, two dimension, when you do the same thing, you get, uh, you get the theory of fine temperature, but of course it's not really hydrodynamics, it's, it's right. non-dissipative. Right. So, so it might be, it might be a similar statement here. So certainly it's not a dissipative theory. Right. Well, but one of the things that we're trying to see is, you know, whether this, uh, this story of uh, non-maximal chaos is related to the fact that we get very, very specific. It's formally hydrodynamics, but it's really non-dissipative, so it doesn't have the physics of hydrodynamics very much. Mm -hmm. It's a hydrodynamics in the sense of being the theory of the energy momentum tensor, basically. Mm -hmm. And do you have any hopes of, of doing this in different, uh, say, flat, you know, flat space, finite temperature? Well, that's related. So, so in this particular case, in, in those cases, this is not a maximally chaotic uh, theory. So, you know, one, one way to, uh, to see what happens uh, in the non-maximally chaotic case. So, you know, this, this, this structure, if we don't uh, break any of the symmetries and we just write the theory of the soft mode, uh, th there is a paper by Hong and collaborators that show that the, the the Lyapunov exponent is necessarily maximal. 
So mm -hmm. something else has to, 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 to come in. So, you know, one way to do it is to just postulate something. The other way is to just look at a particular example and see basically what of the, which of the assumptions does not hold. I mean, dissipation seems to be a natural thing to check, but I mean, I, I don't think that it's quite gives uh, the same sort of uh, the, the thing that we hope for. Uh, so, so flat space might be the example to look for, but uh, we are kind of biased to think that, uh, oh, there's some. Bitcoin uh, we were kind of biased to think that maybe the easiest thing to look at is something that is not quite chaotic, but it's almost. Uh, but maybe flat space would be another way to do it. Basically, you need to have some control over a correlation function of the energy momentum tensor in order to kind of discuss that, that physics. And perhaps in flat space, you don't have enough. All right, thank you. Sure, sure. Martin had a question, I think. Yes, thanks. Um, so thanks for this nice talk. I've got a question uh, regarding your comment about this effective field theory being a nice tool for calculating conformal blocks. So yeah. I'm wondering, so basically you listed two things which people can look at, higher point or one over C corrections. Um, right. Can you also comment whether it's possible with this nonlinear completion of this EFT to compute, say, conformal blocks in a Lorentzian setting for very late times? Because I think this is really an... Um, yeah, we thought about that a little bit. So, so, so there's, a, there, there's a paper, I don't know if you uh, discussed that, but there, depending how late is late time. So, so if you talk about times of order, the central charge, there's this beautiful paper by Per Krauss and collaborators. Uh, so, in principle, the effective field theory should be able to calculate that, but you have to resum a set of diagram. Like, even to calculate uh, the time of order, the log of uh, the central charge, uh, which kind of starts seeing saturation of the OTOCs and things like that, uh, you, you need to sum over ladder diagrams in this effective field theory. So, multiple exchange of the soft mode. Uh, but simple exchanges don't, don't involve any self-interaction. If you do that, uh, then uh, you get, for example, the familiar, if, uh, uh, the familiar story that the conformal blocks exponentiate in uh, large CCFDs. The way it comes about in this uh, effective field theory is because uh, in order to get this conformal block, you sum over infinite number of simple diagrams, the exchange diagram. Now the conjecture is that for those late times, you would need to find a, some resummation uh, scheme of this uh, effective field theory exchanges, some sort of diagram or equivalently some sort of Schwinger Dyson equation to generate those diagrams. Uh, and that will, uh, that will reproduce that result or maybe even generalize that. So, you know, there was maybe a few days last year where I tried to think about how to get that effect. That's, that's, that's something good to think about, I think. But, but, but again, I think you need to kind of uh, have an argument that uh, at those late times, there's a particular set of diagrams that dominates the physics. Uh, and, and, uh, and then, uh, you can resum those diagrams. I mean, because there is kind of a well-defined, uh, interesting, uh, interesting answer there that was found by uh, Hair. Uh, I'm hopeful that there is a story like that, but uh, certainly I haven't been successful in it as much as I thought about that. Let's see, any more questions? If, if I may, I have a rather general question. Go ahead. Um, so the, you mentioned in your introduction that the um, early time regime, um, in the early time regime, the quantum chaos is in a certain sense similar to the, to the classical chaos 
in a sense that I, what I understood is what you meant is that the Lyapunov exponent describes the exponential growth of of excitations. Um, is there is there a precise? Um, well, this 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 was more like in the in the single uh, particle chaos, just a quantum mechanics. I think this is maybe a little bit more complicated in the many body system, but in the in, in the single uh, system, you know, there's no trajectories in phase space, but you can start with some sort of Gaussian wave packet. It is approximately, uh, approximately uh, localized. And then, you know, because uh, H bar is not zero, then it kind of diffuses. So now it's a competition of effect, right? On the one hand, those trajectories that are well-defined stop being well-defined after a while. Uh, on the other hand, the trajectory diverge. So, you know, if you look at short enough time where the trajectories are still well defined, you get basically the classical answer. Another, another circumstance uh, where you get the classical answer is, as you should, is where you, you couple the system to, uh, to, to uh, some external system and you get decoherence. And in, in that case as well, you know that the classical result should hold on general principles. So you should be able to define a layer upon exponent if you, know, you have a decohering system. I think, I think those stories, as far as I understand, maybe are less understood in many body systems. Thanks. And as a, maybe a follow up, I mean, everyone is interested in the connection, as you mentioned, between the early time and the late time. Um, so, could you comment on the um, the late time um, behavior? How how it is different um, in the quantum chaos from the from the classical chaos? I guess you kind of gave a partial answer, definitely already. Well, I mean, th th there is a beautiful paper by Michael Berry in the old days that he discussed basically that uh, that story. Basically, he says that H bar goes to zero in late time are limits that don't commute. Um, and, and, and basically, as soon as you turn on H bar to be as small as, as, as you want, uh, then the late time behavior completely changes. So in some sense, classical ergodicity, again, I think it probably is uh, still in effect in some decohering system, but I, I think uh, for a closed system, classical ergodicity does not uh, play a role, I would say. And there's something else that comes about, and that's something else because quantum mechanics is so different, so it's something else uh, as a different flavor. Spectral statistics, random matrix theory, this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I wish I could remember. Yeah, I wish I could remember that uh, the name of that paper. Anyway, I look for it. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. <laughs> okay. Any final question, comment? Okay. If not, let's thank uh, Moshe again for this very nice talk. Thank you. And that's all for today. So we, we are back next week, back at uh, 16 Central European time. So have fun. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, <laughs> Moshe.